Hello everyone and welcome back to the Recursive Podcast. First of all, I want to thank to all of you for the overwhelming and uh, positive feedback about the show. I think yesterday someone wrote to me that uh, he's been hooked and uh, he's not even part of our ecosystem. So thank you for staying with us, watching us and uh, taking part in the stories of our guests. And when it comes to the next guest, um, this is an invitation that uh, I have been uh, long waiting to make and I've been excited to introduce him to you for a very, very long time. And um, he's been part, in a way, of the show already through the stories of others. Let's see it. Professionally or, or and even personally, mm. I've been probably mostly influenced uh, by uh, my fellow partner Vasco Terziev. You know, we, we shared the co-CEO role of Teleric, uh, went on this fantastic but brutal journey, uh, went in many fights together and, uh, you know, his um, vision, moral compass, values and, uh, and just uh, the sheer scope of uh, his ideas were always very inspirational to me. At the next uh, layers of, of mentors were the Teleric founders and, and Vasil and Zarko. They definitely uh, helped me uh, a lot and, 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 sh and, and yeah, basically shaped me as a, as a better entrepreneur. Teleric founders, they did a really good job at hiring people that have a certain mindset mm. for growth. Uh, and I think that that basically stayed with the company until the end. After I graduated 2007, I met with Vasil. He said, you know, I think, you know, it would be really helpful if you, you know, join the team and become a business analyst, which nobody knew what a business analyst was because there was no other position like a business analyst. I really enjoyed that part. And this is something I, I discovered there that I really enjoy, you know, working with uh, people that are, you know, building the UI and me having a background as a developer, we are very fast at doing iterations and thinking and, 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 and aligning on what's possible, what's not possible and so on. And that kind of a rapid experimentation uh, really got me really into building products. This is why you now understand why this invitation has been long awaited. Uh, but for those who maybe they see you for the first time and I doubt that they're not that many, I will still do a, a short intro because you are a very active ecosystem builder in, uh, in the local uh, tech scene. You're the largest angel investor in Bulgaria and probably one of the most prolific ones in the whole region. You're also a partner at the early stage uh, VC fund 11 Ventures. Prior to your career in venture capital, uh, you co-founded together with uh, three friends, Bulgaria's most successful tech company so far, Teleric. Yes. There, there are more successful <laughs> the, these days, but it was one of the most successful back in its days. <laughs> and the company's exit to progress in 2014 is still accounted as uh, the largest for Bulgaria to this date. But next to the financial success of Teleric, the company had a massive systemic impact on the whole startup and tech community. You and uh, your co-founders are until today dedicated to education of the next generation of tech talent through the Teleric uh, uh, Academy Foundation. Further, you have also created the Startup Incubator Campus X, which hosts a plethora of innovative companies, amongst which is also the first unicorn in Bulgaria, Payhawk. And you're very passionate about giving back. Um, you're a valued mentor of an astonishing number of, uh, of entrepreneurs. You're the founding board member of Endeavor Bulgaria, but also the bridge organization, Bulgaria Innovation Hub. So many hats. Welcome to the Recursive Podcast. Now Thank officially. you, <laughs> Really good to be here. <clears throat> so um, this was actually, in a way, an incomplete list of all your activities, uh, which are dedicated to the development of the local tech scene. And it seems to me that you're working harder than back when you were a CEO of Teleric. Uh, why is that? Why aren't you just a happy and retired, if slightly bored, millionaire? I, I don't know. Uh, I guess it changed throughout the years, but uh, my, my understanding of, uh, of success changed uh, a little bit. And if at 20 years uh, I, I was seeing success as really being um, retired at, at 40 and just uh, enjoying life uh, today what what 
makes me energetic, what gives me all, all the desire to work is really uh, the, the making sure that the next generation of companies do even even better than, than we did. And I find it extremely gratifying. And I, I feel very privileged that uh, rather than wondering what to do with, with my time, I actually do work more than, uh, than before. But uh, you, you know how it goes when you don't see it as a burden, you, you, you don't feel it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get overwhelmed, sometimes you have your challenges and dark moments, but pretty much all of the days are uh, full of a genuine desire to make some progress on all those fronts. Mm -hmm. That's very admirable. And <clears throat> I'm sure that many people in the audience know about uh, the Telerik story. Um, it's an uh, undeniable success. Um, Many have read about the exit and have read also interviews with you, have listened to the podcast with you. Uh, Georgi Nenov is here in the background. <laughs> it was an amazing show. Um, this is why I thought that maybe today we should talk a bit about beyond the story and not focus so much on the, on the historic facts. Uh, we will, of course, touch on them. I hope that uh, you will stick with me. The way that, that I've known you is as a person with various interests and um, but the two things that you're passionate about are entrepreneurship and education is it correct yes it's okay mm -hmm. so let's start from here and uh, maybe unpack them a bit my first question is maybe a bit philosophical but i think it's still relevant um, what is entrepreneurship really about and why is it important for us as an economy and also as a society Mm -hmm. I, I see entrepreneurship as uh, the ability and desire to, to create, to create uh, value. And it all stems from being a, a, a free individual. Um, I've shared my views many times that an entrepreneur is not necessarily the founder of a, of a company. You can be an entrepreneur in many fields, NGO, you, uh, commercial business as a paid salaried employee it's for me uh, more of a state of mind rather than a cap table representation and it goes down to the fundamental um, view that you have to be a free person you have to take responsibility for for your actions you have to learn uh, from them and you have to understand that you really do control so many things uh, in, in the world, in your surroundings, and you better use that time to to have some meaningful uh, impact. Mm. Uh, and that, that that's really the, the, the big battle. How do we get more people to understand how much power they have as uh, free individuals who can create value, who can change the world around them every day? And to achieve that, a very central part is education, hence why the, the focus on, on education, because those two go hand in hand. But it all starts with the individual at the center of everything, grooming up free, capable uh, people who can take care of themselves and take care of their surroundings. Mm -hmm. And part of that is uh, creating this generation of uh, company builders. Mm -hmm. For me personally, uh, entrepreneurship uh, is also something that, uh, you know, it, it marks the shift of the mindset of a victim to someone who is, you know, yeah. taking charge. And uh, I somehow feel that we definitely meet, need more of that. <laughs> yeah, that's my biggest beef. People feeling victims of everything rather than taking the reins and uh, driving, driving change of, mm -hmm. of their own life and that of, of others. Because more often than not, the problem is uh, with, within your head and your perceptions, not so much the objective reality. Mm. Do you think we can somehow replicate this growth mindset from the entrepreneurial community on a broader societal level? And how, is, how, how can we just, you know, make this bubble bigger? I think it's it's happening naturally. One thing that definitely is the first spark is just seeing success. That's why the Telerik story, uh, part of that story is important because it showed that it can be done. You can build a meaningful company from here with uh, pretty much uh, Bulgarian uh, workforce uh, and um, 
it 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 is important to build more and more cases like that. Now we have our first unicorn. Then we'll have the second more, one. <laughs> second one, third one. And, and you see that it can be done. It can be done bigger. It can be done better. It can be done uh, faster. These are the, the stories when in larger numbers and given enough time start to change perceptions. Mm. It becomes the new reality. Before, uh, 10 million fundraise was uh, seen as something extraordinary. Now you see that more and more. So in the heads of the younger generation of entrepreneurs, it's not unusual. It's not uh, something uh, extremely difficult or improbable that you can raise a 10 million round as a Bulgarian uh, company or mm -hmm. a company from, from the Balkans. So uh, it just takes time and, and good examples. And it also takes a lot of proactive work to really scale that as much as, as possible, which is uh, fostered by many initiatives like entrepreneurs, um, not just staying in their bubble, but uh, going to schools, going back to universities, talking to uh, younger kids, inspiring them, planting a different model of, of uh, success, uh, helping them believe in themselves, uh, and uh, also supporting them, not just by virtue of an example, but in practical terms of like being a, a mentor to uh, a young guy trying to build a company um, supporting their home, uh, the, the, their alma mater, their high school, in, in any way possible. And those small things, they, they tend to, to add up. It's just about genuine care for, for the, the others. If you put it uh, as a central point of what, what you do, it doesn't take heroics. It takes just a lot of people to do a lot of small steps. And given enough time, you see the, the magic uh, the outcome. Magic. <laughs> uh, by the way, thank you for bringing uh, school and alma mater because it's somehow related to my next question. And I, I thought it's still worth it, you know, to go a bit back in time uh, in your biography because there is something that struck me. I was doing my research, uh, reading about uh, how you developed, you know, from uh, you know, someone who originally wanted to do sports and uh, you w went then to the first English language school, which is actually a good school here in, in Sofia. Um, you graduated business administration from the American University yeah. in Bulgaria. And if we look at your path in this way, and we need to remember that back then, these examples that we have today for entrepreneurs, they, they weren't really there. We actually had a very wrong examples of entrepreneurship back then. I wonder why, because why aren't you, um, why didn't you do a career in uh, some big multinational corporation in finance or management or, because this is what, you know, back then we were just, told that. This is just a turn of events. I've, uh, mm -hmm. I've shared the story that uh, after I graduated from, from high school. I was accepted in a US university. Uh, but all of my friends went to AUBG. Three of my classmates, people with whom I'd been from eighth to 11th grade, went to AUBG. So I said, okay, well, I'll postpone becoming an immigrant to the US. I'll spend a few years at um, AUBG, have a great time. And then I'll work a few years, then I'll do an MBA, and then I'll move to the, to the U.S. So as, um, as a teenager, more or less my ideal was about uh, moving, moving to, the, to the U.S., uh, having, doing a degree in finance, economics, and uh, settling there as a consultant, investment banker, because that, that, that's what, what, that was cool back then. <laughs> that is what we uh, also told us. But, yeah. and, and things were more or less progressing according to plan, uh, but they took a sharp turn in uh, 1999 when uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't manage to, to get an internship uh, in, the, in the summer after my um, junior year. Mm -hmm. And together with my uh, roommate, we said, okay, what are, what are we going to do? Said, Why not go to work and travel and toss a few burgers? So that's what we did for four months. But the, the program allowed us to stay for an extra month. And I decided to, to stay with a friend of my father's uh, who, who was uh, an IT consultant. And... Uh, because uh, he uh, wanted me to, to be 
helpful rather than just be, be around. He said, help my wife uh, with, with her business. And uh, she, she had an ERP and CRM implementation consultancy. And I didn't know what that means. I didn't care, but I said, sure. I'm going to I'm going to help. And as I was doing that, I got fascinated by by technology and by one very specific thing uh, which is um which was uh, very new back then it was internet telephony. Mm. And it struck me that you can lower the phone bill of a company many times over. Uh, it cost a few dollars uh, per minute from Bulgaria to the US with net to phone it was like 5 cents or something. So I decided I'm going to try to build a business around that. For many reasons, it was uh, wildly unsuccessful, uh, not least of which uh, that it was a few years um, before it, uh, its time. Uh, just the, the infrastructure in Bulgaria wasn't such to, that you could build a business uh, based on the lousy dial-up uh, available back then. But what really happened is that it got me interested in technology. I had never cared about technology. My touch point with technology back then was PowerPoint, Word, and Excel, and Internet Explorer. That that was it. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you could, I wasn't illiterate in a sense, but mm-hmm. I wasn't too too literate. But this this uh, trying to build this um, internet telephony business changed my interest. And I started reading the fat books about uh, networking, about how the whole stack works. Uh, I started uh, the, the joy of the 90s to reinstall Windows uh, every, every week uh, and to try to, to change some configurations in it. And one thing led to another. And uh, the following uh, summer after graduation, uh, several friends from AUBG created a software company, an outsourcing company, and uh, I joined there as a project manager. Wouldn't say I was terribly competent, but I had a lot of uh, genuine desire to to do the work. And uh, from then onwards, uh, it was just a career choice that uh, I don't want to go back to to finance and banking. I'm going to pursue a, a career in technology. Then uh, after I finished my last course at uh, AUBG, because I had one extra semester because of the leave of absence, uh, mm. because of the burger tossing uh, experience, <laughs> uh, I joined a company called Swift Pro, uh, mm. which was a UK company that had uh, developed an office in, in Bulgaria, again as a project manager. And there uh, first uh, joined Christo, with whom I had worked in the previous company, mm. Zafod Software. Yes. Uh, very interesting experience because uh, the company didn't do extremely well because of the uh, crisis, because of many other things. But all of the people were phenomenal and they did fine in, in other uh, endeavors and uh, hold those memories very near and dear. <laughs> so that's more or less how I, I made this, the, the shift to technology. Then a year and a half later, uh, we, we founded Teleric. Uh, I've, I've shared the story where uh, we didn't... Um, we didn't see the future the same way with uh, our former back then boss. Uh, he let go Boyko, we left. So what what was like a fuzzy idea, oh yeah, we want to have a company, etc. More or less materialized by, by necessity. Uh, and we started off as a uh, outsourcing company, but evolved into a product company again by necessity. So my journey uh, in terms of moving to technology, becoming an entrepreneur in uh, the technology space, uh, more or less was a matter of many, many things that didn't go as expected. Mm. But- <clears throat> it's actually interesting, you know, to to hear the turning points. By the way, what, what was the name of uh, this uh your father's friend who basically, you know, pushed you for a month where you maybe saw for the first time, you know, technology, but also entrepreneurship, I guess, from his Vlado. Wife, Vlado and, and his wife. <laughs> Gail. <laughs> so thank you to both of them. <laughs> thank you, Vlado and Gail, and thank you to many other people. And to other many people. others, yes, of course, also. Because, you know, mm-hmm. it's a good opportunity to thank all those, uh, all those people because I'm grateful to 
all of the people with whom I've worked with, including those with whom I haven't had like the, the best experiences in mm. both ways, them to me and me, me to them, because each of those experiences uh, shapes you. Yes. And um, there was a reason for it to happen. Mm. When I was listening to you, um, I was thinking that uh, in a way, I think we have something similar where you you put you know the story in a way that like it's happening to you, but in fact you were taking charge of your life and you were learning and you were curious and uh, you were also confident to make the next steps, although you thought. Well, maybe I'm not the most competent one here. Um, I wonder, is this something that you were born with or is it something that you develop over time? Because I'm sure that many people out there have the best qualities to become entrepreneurs, to become successful, but they just don't dare. Mm -hmm. Where is this coming from? What do you think? Well, I was always competitive. Like okay. I didn't, I didn't see myself as an entrepreneur. That was not planted in in the family. That mm. be, I was, I was seeing myself <clears throat> as a happily employed uh, person and didn't have a problem with with that. But uh, I guess the the competitive angle, that uh, the, the the ambition to 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 do well, whether it's in sports, whether it's in uh, an edu educational setting or somewhere else, also helped make uh, make the shift once the circumstances and the necessity uh, kicked in um, but i i think this can be this can be fostered it's part of the and it can be embedded in the education about mm -hmm. <clears throat> helping kids dream bigger believe in their capabilities and and just explore um, and i just hope that the educational system would evolve more more towards that rather than cramming stuff that 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 you don't need because um, if you teach kids those things like to dream to explore give them the tools how to do it give them the uh, the means to understand themselves a little bit uh, earlier and not like many of us from our generation which like a pinball hitting all kinds of problems and doing introspection about what did I, what went wrong was it me was it somebody else to come to conclusions that somebody can uh, like teach you mm -hmm. and then you can build upon that mm -hmm. <clears throat> i find it interesting that uh, you mentioned competitiveness being somehow at the bottom of it um, i wonder how did it go then for you being part of a team of four ambitious friends um was weren't there or wasn't there a competition between you how did you manage that you shared in the previous conversations that you had to learn a lot about ego and, it was uh, one of my biggest learning uh, experiences uh, and it was one of the, actually the hardest moments of building uh, a company and as as an investor I can share that most of the times companies do fall apart because of uh, founder drama and people not getting along and making the best of their potential and not so much about uh, mar market circumstances. And for us, it was really hard because you have four smart, ambitious people who have uh, not worked in a similar environment uh, before having to build a company and all of us were very rough around uh, the edges super defensive on some topics um, super immature on on others uh, uh, everybody was the smartest uh, person in the room and it took us some time to figure out that if we continue down with the original path we'd end up bankrupt even though we're all the smartest people in the room. And then we had like an epiphany. Well, what do we want to be right or to be or to do right as the, mm. as the saying goes. And we decided to do right, that we want to, to build a company, that we want to succeed and the ego needed to take a back step. And uh, this was one of the, the, the the major catalysts uh, of, of change, learning to trust uh, those and to build upon their strengths and to mitigate their their weaknesses. Because all of us at any point in time have a lot of strengths and a lot of weaknesses. And mm -hmm. it's all about working on yourself to expose the strengths and like uh, 
mitigate the weaknesses and doing the same in uh, a team environment where you collectively help each other uh, make the most out of your talents and minimize the, the damage done by your weaknesses and you create the right setup that uh, explores uh, uh, those those capacities. Mm. Ah, this is actually really hard and sometimes we're not even aware that we're doing that, uh, not only in business uh, relations but uh, in general. Um, this is also a model that you obviously spread and, and nurtured as a culture in the whole organization. Um, in the recent insight report uh, published by Endeavor, there is this very, this amazing uh, diagram where you see, you know, somehow Telerik yeah. in the middle of the, of an ecosystem of, uh, um, of, of companies and 50 of them, from what I remember, mm -hmm. were founded by former employees of Telerik. Now, this is a, a model that uh, I think, let's, let's unpack it a bit and let's see what entrepreneurs today can draw as a conclusion or as a learning from, from, this, uh, from this model. I'm not going to suggest you, although I know mm -hmm. some, some things, particles of the story. So the, the, the major learnings, uh, for me that, that come to mind is one it's important to have a, a success story like like Telerik so that you can believe it can be done because most of the time this is the biggest problem you don't believe it can be done you because it has not been done in this geography in that area uh, with with uh, these people whatever the, the reason is but just the belief that uh, it can be done so the second one is um, people getting the skills on how it's done. Uh, many of, of our colleagues have built products from zero to millions in, in revenue. They know the whole life cycle. So that's uh, very special mm -hmm. knowledge because you see everything from A to Z rather than just one part of the, of the, yeah. mm -hmm. of the alphabet. The third one is the importance of hiring good people. Mm. We we're very fortunate to to work with a lot of high quality people and this became a self-selection bias so uh, highly competent very curious uh, hard-working ambitious it's only natural that those people then create uh, the, their own their own things having seen how it's done knowing that it's it's possible and also having uh, one other important element which is the social bond uh, because uh, People in the company, uh, they, they formed very strong friendships, very strong bonds between each other. And then this translated into them creating teams, uh, hiring uh, former colleagues and really um, interwining the, the root uh, system. Yes, Christoph and Borisov was here. He was sharing exactly the story, how they actually started as a team in Telerik and then decided yeah, that they're going yeah. to move forward. And the fifth yes. uh, important part is having uh, material outcomes, uh, meaning big company exits and that exit, the proceeds of that exit flowing to a lot of people, like having a long tail, basically how you structure your cap table. Mm -hmm. uh, in our case, over 350 people had uh, stock and options, so yeah. a big Part of our exit also flowed to to those people who could um, start a business, who could decide whether they want to stay in a company or uh, do something else. But they, many of them had choice, and, uh, and and the first capital. And last but not least is really the the support uh, network that you have a soft landing. Okay, you decided to create uh, a, a new company, but like your former bosses, uh, colleagues being the first to, to support you with an angel investment, um, uh, support you with knowledge, with their own network really gives you one extra confidence that you can do it. And second, practically it makes uh, things a little bit uh, easier for you. So it's really important that all of those companies who are the second generation, third generation of success, really look at, at those elements of one, 
creating the right ownership structure so that uh, their success means the success of many people, fostering the right culture, meritocratic, great people, uh, performance uh, focused, so that you can, so that you do everything on a world-class level. Inside this company as an employee, as an entrepreneur tomorrow, it's, it's a mindset of excellence. Mm-hmm. And also having uh, the, this strong bonding where it's not just work, it's more of a mission that gets translated into other missions uh, uh, later on. Mm-hmm. I, I'm very confident, like knowing the people, seeing how they how they do things, they, they are upping our game in every level possible. And I'm pretty sure that they'll do better than us in in community building down the road as well. Hmm. They're also, I think, partially replicating this model of uh, of the cap table that you've built, letting also uh, employees having a vested interest in the company. And I think this is very important. I mean, with Christo Christo, who was also recently in the podcast, we were speaking about the importance of vested interest. And it's not just from employees, but it's also, you know, from a broader um, community of uh, people who would be part of this technological um, or success of technological companies. Um, You later on became an investor, an angel investor. You joined also the team of um, 11 Ventures. And uh, this is, uh, again, a shift. Mm -hmm. Former um, entrepreneurs and founders, they often do good investors, but not necessarily. Because being an entrepreneur is also somehow, from my perspective, related to having a very hands-on approach Mm -hmm. to things, something that you can't have as an in, and, and as an investor, and it would be also a counterproductive if you start, you know, meddling into founders. How did you learn to do that? Um, actually, early stage investing, uh, whether it's angel investing or uh, like, like from a fund perspective, like Eleven Ventures, mm-hmm. which is a pre-seed fund, uh, largely you do get to not lose the entrepreneurial touch. You mm-hmm. are like an extension to the team and exactly your operational knowledge, excellence, uh, because you've walked down the whole uh, uh, path, you can you can help people with, with a myriad of, of things and every company is different. So you plug in a different hole, you engage as much as is needed and you don't lose the touch. What you have to learn is how to be disciplined about um, investing and where's the border between investor and entrepreneur and you rather than uh, trying to do the work you try to help people develop the capacity to be able to do the to do the work Uh, and you approach it more from a coach perspective rather than a, a player perspective even if you have to be like on the field uh, some points but it's one of the uh, the things we later on understood as uh, founders and um, uh, c-level execs in the in the company that it's not about you doing the best job it's really about creating the right systems putting the right people in place and them doing uh, the best job uh, possible better than than you could do it rather than you trying to solve all the problems of the mm-hmm. of the world and this translated to my investment uh, philosophy as to what i need to be to be doing mm-hmm. um, it, it, it's stuff you learn i mean it was it was new to me it was uh, full of uh, mistakes uh, but I've learned to accept that when you're doing something new, you have to pay for lunch, meaning there's no no free free knowledge. And as an angel investor, I've made uh, bad investments. I've uh, meddled where I shouldn't have. I've been too far off from you know situations where I should have intervened. But I, then again, when you haven't done it uh, for many years, it's only natural for you to make mistakes. The only thing is, did you learn something and how many fails did it take you to learn uh, that, that specific lesson? Mm. Oh, failure is definitely a big part of the journey of uh, every entrepreneur, also mm-hmm. investor. Um, <clears throat> but uh, there is also something else that I would like us to talk about. And uh, I was curious. So just recently, we announced the first Bulgarian unicorn, one of these 50 companies that we mentioned, which uh, 
you know, came from 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 the Telerik uh, ecosystem. You are supporter of Payhawk from the very beginning, as we heard also in the in the introduction. He sees yeah. you as someone you know who um, has mentored him through through uh, on the, on his path. Um, you're also invested in Payhawk uh, through Eleven Ventures. How does it feel to be part of this success now? You know, part of a success of a unicorn company. The same way as being uh, part of the success of Teleric and many other things that are behind you. Mm. And because you're into it, you see it happening. So if it's news for you, it wasn't uh, news uh, <laughs> news. Uh, Yes. For for yes. us who are deep into it, uh, and um, it's funny because as much as I enjoy it, I I'm thinking about how do we get to like ten unicorns in the next seven eight, uh, eight uh, seven eight years. What do we need to do? What's mm -hmm. what's missing? Is it just a matter of waiting it out, or there's things that we can proactively do to? expand the opportunity and to see it uh, happen earlier on so it, it's a very interesting question because and and I, i've spoken a bit about it uh, and as much as it may surprise you the answer to the question do you feel successful about a b c d the the honest answer is not necessarily because most of the time i'm not looking back to stuff mm -hmm. that has already happened, I'm looking at where I'm going and what's not right. So mm -hmm. I have my constant battles and anxiety about things not going according to to plan, struggling with uh, with things uh, and and whatnot. So you you either look forward or you look back and. All of us are young people, so I, I very much believe that we shouldn't be looking back about past success, but rather we should just use it as a stepping stone to be more ambitious about what we can do looking uh, forward. So it's only natural that uh, we don't rejoice that much in prior success, but rather we put ourselves in situations of uh, inconvenience, incompetence, etc., but ma ma making progress and feeling alive. Mm -hmm. Maybe at, when we become 75, we'll be thinking only about the past and not so much about the future. But when we're in our best years, I believe that we should be looking forward uh, to... And, and mm -hmm. naturally, we should see more challenges than, than opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, than, than past success, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I wonder to what conclusions did you come when you were thinking of what we should do to have, you know, five, ten unicorns, uh, which are... Actually, I'm going to even ask you a bit broader question because I think now is the right timing, given that uh, we do have now um, a broader understanding why technological entrepreneurship is so important, why we should invest a bit more into the development of the startup ecosystem. Which are the decisions that we need to make today as an ecosystem? And I'm speaking from the perspective not only of investors and founders, but... Um, also uh, policymakers, academia, so that we have this, I don't know, 10 unicorns. I mean, maybe that shouldn't be the measure of, uh, of success, but let's yeah. say that. Well, it's, it's a measure of success in the sense that it puts you on the map, that mm -hmm. you become a known technology hub. Mm -hmm. And that's good because that means more flow of money, more corporates coming in, more investment uh, in in the region and in the specific uh, uh, field. So mm -hmm. that that's why it's good. Other than that, it's a vanity uh, metric. What yes. what really matters is uh, the overall success. Meaning that, in addition to the unicorns that uh, are extremely newsworthy. It's also important that it's not, you know, a blank space between them and everything, everything else that you have mm -hmm. a lot of mid-sized companies that you have a lot of success spread out, a lot of knowledge uh, spread out because that that's in, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Also, the middle class is the, the backbone of, uh, of everything. Not everybody can be a unicorn. And like in a society, you, don't, you want to have the bulk of the, of the people to be like middle class. 
rather than to have just a handful of haves and a lot of uh, have-nots at, at the bottom. So same in, mm. in an ecosystem setting, you really need to build a very well-stacked pyramid uh, of, uh, of the different uh, <laughs> types of um, I like uh, stakeholders. There and is a, just there is this also very good quote that uh, I don't even remember where I read it or heard it that uh, a startup is as big as its ecosystem. <laughs> and the venture capital fund and many <laughs> others. Yeah, and many others. Okay, sorry for interrupting you. Please uh, go on. No, no, that, that, yeah. that's very relevant. So essentially, all of us have to be sensitive about reinvesting, and that's mm -hmm. what do we reinvest money, time, network, knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Basically, the assets that matter to us. And the more of our assets that go to the betterment of an ecosystem, the faster the results will come and the bigger they will be and the more sustainable they will be. And it's choice. With my money, do I, after I make an exit, do I invest it in uh, real estate uh, on the Seychelles and buy a boat? Or do I put it in local venture capital funds, Bulgarian, Balkan funds? Do I put it in crypto or I make angel investments in, in five companies? Uh, mm. I'm, I'm not arguing about doing uh, like all in into, into companies or, or funds uh, locally, but the more you do put in this economy and not like uh, in, in real estate and buying the 21st apartment, but mm. rather investing it in the innovative economy, the more the outsize the, the effect. If you acquire knowledge, well, make it your mission to, 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 to spread it. Don't leave it within your team, your company, like uh, share it. That's one of the things that, that made Teleric successful. Mm -hmm. We were not extremely knowledgeable you could argue that we were also not uh, extremely smart, but we were extremely focused on capturing knowledge. Wherever there was a small breakthrough, that it became the knowledge of, uh, of everyone else. Every single team, every manager, and all the good practices uh, spilled. And this helped us really up up our game, mm -hmm. listening to customers, uh, uh, ex experimenting here and there, and then all of that uh, translating to the new average for the for, for the company. And same on an on an ecosystem level. <clears throat> if most of the successful entrepreneurs do share their knowledge, participate in user groups, uh, speak at uh, events, uh, give uh, interviews, whether it's to the recursive, share knowledge uh, here and there, all of that really, really adds up. It takes time. Yeah, you don't like the stage. You don't uh, uh, want to be a media rock star, but it's your obligation. And the more people that do that, the easier it becomes for, for everyone else. It's simple game theory. Mm -hmm. um, so if we reuse most of our assets for the betterment of the, of the ecosystem, one, and we use our assets to uh, improve the educational foundation, many good things will happen. We won't stop at like five or 10 unicorns. It will be a sustainable change of the whole economy and, uh, and society. It just takes 20 years, that, that, that's the issue. But today, it, we have to start today so that we see the positive results in 10, uh, 20, 20 years. So I would appeal to all founders, whether you're in Bulgaria, Romania, etc., really put a lot of effort and money and everything to support anything around education. Uh, and entrepreneurial education and and the things that create a different type of aspiration in in kids mm -hmm. coupled with active participation in the, the local local ecosystem invest in the vc funds not one like as many as you can invest in companies uh, join boards uh, work uh, work hard to to give those um, companies and people different different outcomes it, it's all a numbers game if you have a lot of people doing it you don't require heroics on the on behalf of anyone mm. um, thank you for saying all this uh, giving back uh, this you know this mindset this mentality is is very important I think 
for many of us here in the region, it's hard to understand why is this paying off over time because long term planning and, and goal setting is not <laughs> our thing, it's not in our DNA. I think we're now learning how to plan for, for the future and how to plan for the next 10 years so that we make yeah. these uh, decisions. Um, it's just understanding interconnectedness that you are connected to all those people, not just on the metaphysical and spiritual level, mm -hmm. but just that you as part of a society are, are connected and your success, their success re is really intertwined. Uh, mm -hmm. And you need to care about uh, others and their success because this translates to a much healthier society. So very selfishly, you have to do it. It's just a, a long-term game, but it's selfish because mm -hmm. you, your kids, uh, my kids, uh, etc. They will they will live uh, in a better place, and for them, uh, making the next uh, climbing the next step would be would be easier yes. in 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 the journey. Um, hmm. And and you know what? It, it, I didn't think about life uh, in in that way when I was. 15, 20, 25, it, it came naturally. But, but seeing how much um, the, the, the positives of all of us rowing in the same direction and not just being selfish about our success, um, it's super important for, for the young entrepreneurs to understand their, their, their role and how much they can impact everything by not focusing only on their own. Ultimately, it, the, their success of, of them as entrepreneurs, their companies is the foundation of everything, but it just has to be coupled with uh, mm -hmm. the care for, for others. Which brings me to, um, to a question or, I don't know, this is something that I have personally a problem with. Um, somehow, it's not only in Bulgaria, actually in Bulgaria less, but more internationally. We nurtured this notion of the startup founder who is bold, you know, who is pitching with high self-esteem, slightly sociopathic or like a, 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 the specter of high functioning sociopathy. And at the same time, you are a successful entrepreneur, uh, but you place a lot of importance on um, social responsibility and responsibility for one's choices as a whole on being humble uh, when it c comes to learning from, from mistakes. Um, do you think the two scenarios, I mean, how do the two scenarios relate to each other? What is uh, your perspective on things? Isn't when it comes to entrepreneurship and actually being a startup founder, you have to be fast, you know, you have to be very decisive. I actually think they, they, they come at different points in time. Okay. If I were like what I am today, I am not sure whether we would have done like an exceptional job in, in our environment uh, back then. Okay. Uh, you have to be very competitive. You have to be very ambitious, uh, maybe not on, on the other side of the spectrum of being a sociopath and mm -hmm. not caring about uh, anyone you gotta aspire to be um, a level five leader uh, as Jim Collins in his book good to great uh, yes. says and you know I believe those characteristics uh, really make for for a good leader but it just happens over time you don't if you, if you are a first time entrepreneur like many of the people we work with and we back you you can't expect that but you do expect them to transition slowly to 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 the other way of uh, of of thinking and understanding what comes after their individual success at first it's all about their success and a little bit of mm -hmm. care for anything outside of their company but it's just about managing the gradual transition towards um, uh, taking a bigger role into everything outside of their of their company but you can't like build a super uh, competitive uh, company in a competitive environment and be you know all kumbaya I, I don't think it's mm. it, it, it can happen 
When do you think is this transitioning happening? I, by the way, uh, good to great. It's a book actually that I have from you, so thank you for it. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. Yes, and you know, part of you know the thesis there is that uh, you pick the right people for the job already from the beginning. So um, I was wondering when do you transition to this kind of leadership where um, it's a lot about social responsibility and responsibility for for your choices about people. I don't know. I, I think for, for different people, it comes at a different age. For some, it comes at 30. For others, at 40. For others, mm -hmm. at 70. It's just a matter of getting to that point mm -hmm. that, that you understand the role of your success and how it translates to, to, to the success of others. There's like no perfect age and no perfect journey on how you do that. I don't think you can do it with a prescription. Yeah, okay. It's just about knowing that this is the ultimate thing that you have to, to do, like do good for others if you're fortunate enough to have done well for yourself. Speaking of the ultimate, um, we're now at the end of our conversation. And uh, I was when I was listening to interviews, and I think you were saying this in the, in the Superhuman podcast, uh, that you're very, um, that you're kind of, you know, famous for your diligence in goal setting and, uh, you know, measuring your progress over time, both in professional and, and, and personal capacity. Um, this is why I wanted to, to ask you, what is actually the ultimate goal? And the question that we ask to all our guests is, what do you want to be remembered for? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's a hard question. Mm. Well, I mean, we always answer it from today's perspective, you know. This can change over time. What do I want to be remembered for? 10, 15 years ago, uh, when fame probably played a bigger part in, in my thinking and uh, ego was not uh, the same as, as uh, today, I, I probably would have had an easier answer. Now, I just want to remember every day that it was kind of worth it, that mm. it, 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 I did manage to do something uh, relevant, something, something good. Um, you don't know how much you live, so all the, all the plans are <laughs> like up in the air. Especially now. Uh, yeah. I I want to be remembered as somebody who hopefully expire, uh, inspired people to dream of becoming better versions of uh, of themselves and having the responsibility to to pass uh, to pass it on to 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 others because ultimately I, I I was thinking about this a few weeks ago whatever you do. Whatever the accomplishment, uh, you will not be remembered in 50 years, most likely. In 100, unless you've done some huge breakthrough or you have committed a really awful atrocity that you make the history books, you also wouldn't be remembered. And in a 500,000 year horizon, regardless of what you do, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be remembered by pretty much uh, anyone. So. If you take this perspective, it really doesn't uh, doesn't matter because it's just uh, you will be remembered by whom and for for how long. Mm. It, it's irrelevant. The only thing that matters is doing something good as much as you can for the time you are you are given on on this earth and take, taking uh, taking it a little bit easier. So as much as I plan a lot about the future as much as i dream in 10 20 year horizons i also try to take the vanity out of what you will be remembered for and all the greatness and this and that out of the equation because it gets in the way mm. well you will definitely be remembered by uh, your kids two wonderful daughters um, i wanted to ask you also a bit about them being a next generation of i don't know maybe an entrepreneur i heard I think from your wife at some point that one of your daughters is actually you know, aspiring uh, to a career maybe in entrepreneurship. Uh, what do you try to teach them? Very basic things. 
Uh, I'm not one of those uh, super ambitious parents who want to their, their kids to follow this path of uh, you go to piano lessons and this and that and uh, exercise uh, five times a week in these sports and your grades have to be like this. One of them is more uh, concentrated in academic affairs, the other one not so much. Uh, but uh, both of them are very nice, positive, um, positive kids and uh, our conversation center around them. I want you to be good, good human beings, uh, to understand you're not alone in, in this world. You've got to take care of others and you have to rely on them when you are down, uh, which is also a derivative of you being good to the, the people around you. And I want you to be focused on uh, and, and dedicated to whatever you decide to do. The only thing that I don't appreciate is people wasting their time. Uh, whether you become a world-class musician, entrepreneur, etc., maybe you don't have the talent, but for the little talent that you have, don't waste it by squandering uh, uh, time. So th th those are the, the, the simple things. Follow, find what, what you want to do. Because, for example, my, my girls, they're absolutely different in terms of aspirations. One wants to uh, become an actress and is more on the uh, performance and art side of stuff. The other one is a lot more uh, ambitious, entrepreneurial. Um, so you can have the same approach uh, to, to both of them. Uh, mm. And each of them has different talents. And the only thing I care about is them exploring those uh, those talents and not being lazy. Hmm. I wish someone who have told me that when I was a bit younger. Um, what did you oh, want? Oh, to stay positive and have a sense of humor, because I, I find <laughs> oh, that pretty another, essential. Yes, this yeah. is also an important, not to take yourself too seriously. No. <laughs> uh, switching the perspective. What did you learn from them? Pretty much everything I learned about uh, business, the, the major one being something that uh, became part of uh, my management philosophies. It sounds lofty, management <laughs> philosophies, but I call it controlled failures. Um, and I, a, as they were growing up, I learned something very important, how kids learn about stuff, that it's always through, through failure. And you as a parent cannot... Um, cannot eliminate failure. What you can do is to control the swim lane uh, where, where failure happens and to minimize the, the impact. And this has served me well in, in business too, because you see that uh, in a business setting, people are like kids. Uh, many times you know they're gonna fail, but you have to embrace it and let them fail. Just make sure that they don't fail in too big of a way to risk the company, to, to break themselves or, or others. But accept that fails are a very natural part of, uh, of learning. And you apply that to yourself as well. Well, failure can be also very, very liberating. Once, you know, everything is shattered. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the hardest, hardest things to understand, uh, that you're not perfect. Uh, mm. And you never will be. And did you did you think that? Took me a little bit of time, probably <laughs> 35, 40 years, and then I finally <laughs> came to the conclusion that uh, it's a battle you you can't uh, you can't win. I'm joking, uh, but um, there is this unhealthy desire in most of us to be perfect, to be really good, to uh, just n either not see flaws in yourself because you might have them but you might decide not to see them mm -hmm. or to like fix everything that's mm -hmm. imperfect uh, about you and you just can't it's uh, it's a battle you you can't win and just have to understand what's more important than than other stuff and focus on on what matters mm -hmm. same in business same you know sure. in everything speaking of imperfections there is always you know the other side of, of things so one imperfection usually also makes you very good at other things um, that you also understand the the other side of the coin mm -hmm. yes and appreciate it vasco thank you for being here 
um, I really enjoyed that. I think we never really sat like and talked about business and life and uh, it's been very insightful for me and I hope also for those uh, watching us. And it was a pleasure. Yes. Um, at the end, um, I really would like, you know, us maybe to sit together in 10 years and look at, uh, hey, did we actually make the right co <laughs> choices back then? <laughs> did we do the right things? Probably not, but the only thing that matters is are we going to be happy in 10 years? So I wish upon the two of us and all of our viewers to, to find that path uh, mm -hmm. so that they don't have regrets about where they are in 10 years. <laughs> yes, thank you. In the next episode of the Recursive Podcast, we welcome Kosti Jordanov, a co-founder of the global streaming platform for combat sports events, Fight. And we see also as important part of the ecosystem, uh, entrepreneurs helping other entrepreneurs and, and all of that, and then becoming angel investors and all of that happening within a very, very short period of time. Um, I, I think being a startup today is, is much easier uh, in a way uh, from, from the perspective of fundraising uh, than it was 10 years ago. Uh, when we did our kind of first funding for anything really, way before Fight, there was no, no ecosystem here. I would not have went, even for Fight, I would not have reached out to Bill if, uh, and, and Tim Draper if there was uh, a better option here. So I, I think the access to capital is very important. This is one of the important components for, for us to see more successful companies coming out of Bulgaria. Uh, we now see that um, actually two of the funds just uh, closed their new rounds. Uh, over 70 million euros. Mm. These are these are significant amounts of money uh, that that are starting being deployed in our uh, in our ecosystem here. And I think this is actually very important for not only for uh, kind of IT and startups and all those cool stuff. I think it's, it's it's important for Bulgaria. I think this is one of the not that many niches that could actually drive growth, uh, financial growth and economical growth, and that could change our society for good. And if you are just as passionate about innovation as we are, hit subscribe for the Recursive Podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. We're everywhere.